Welcome everyone to the webinar. My name is Lucas Schostrom. I'm an editor with Hortz Derryman and as you can see on your screen here, we're proud to bring you this webinar with Mike Hutchins as both host and presenter today. He'll be talking about choosing your feed additives widely, wisely and today's webinar is going to be brought to you by Elanco and you can check out more about Elanco at elanco.us. Of course, we bring these webinars to you because of our sponsors and we'll have the next one the uh, second Monday, first Monday, second Monday, I always forget, of the month um, at noon central time. And uh, as long as you're subscribed to this webinar here, you'll get an email the, the Friday before and the day of so that you know when the next one's on. Um, and as I said before, you can check out our archives at hordes.com slash webinars uh, and, and view any of the past webinars that we have shown already. So Mike, without anything else, I'll turn it over to you. Well, Lucas, thanks very much, and Patty, thank you for the, giving the head start. We want to welcome everybody and uh, give you a, a extend a belated uh, Easter greetings to you, as far as that goes. We have a, hopefully a fun seminar for you. We will challenge you. We'll make some of you unhappy. We'll make some of you mad. That's always good. Good to keep a webinar, and as always, you get to vote three times. So get ready to vote here in just a few minutes. So let's get on with our topic here and a little bit of background information. Uh, first of all, what is a feed additive uh, by definition? Very simple. If you're in my class, you'd have to be able to repeat this to me, perhaps on exam, it is a feed ingredient uh, that functions in a non-nutrient role. The best example is sodium bicarbonate. Uh, bicarb basically is a rumen buffer. Sodium is a nutrient, so uh, some of these products will wear dual hats. They may have a nu nutrient associated with it, but they may have another function other than, for example, meeting a sodium requirement. We thought it might be interesting to those of you online to see who who's feeding what. Every year, Hordes Dairyman does a very nice survey of herds from their readership. They they select the sample herd. Here is the 2011 numbers. So you can see 2011, 2006, and you can see the winner. The winner is sodium bicarbonate or buffers. I had almost half the farmers feeding it. And you can look down through this. I, I highlighted a couple of... Um, uh, one's in yellow. The third one down is rumenzen or monenzen. Uh, you will see uh, our, our farmers reported 22% of them are using it. According to Elanco, uh, that number is more like 40 to 45 to 50%. I think that's the first take home message. Some of my dairy producers don't know what they're feeding. So if that's the only thing you do and say, I'm going to check on that crook of a Hutchins to see, in fact, if we are actually feeding it. You come down over here to your microtoxin binders. I guess uh, this surprised me a little bit. Uh, almost a quarter of the people in the U.S. indicating they're putting a microtoxin binder in. Probably reflects risks that you might have with a silage, with a bunker in a bag, high moisture corn, where it's kind of like an insurance policy as far as that goes. The anionic products really surprised me at 4%. I thought that would be higher than that uh, because of the, uh, the really the great additive in terms of it adjusting blood calcium levels here. And mold inhibitors in hay, pretty high percent. That's probably pretty much uh, propionic acid, but but again, 21%. So it's kind of interesting to see what our read or what your readers are, uh, Patty and and uh, Lucas, and probably reflects uh, pretty much heavy Midwest and uh, and eastern parts of the United States because it's based off your readership. And obviously, there's a lot of dairy farms in those various regions from there. So you might ask the question, well, why would you select a feed additive? And and basically, some people would argue it just covers up poor management. That's a bad reason. I hope that's not why people look at additives. Some people. Say well it doesn't cost much to put that in I'll challenge you that a nickel here a nickel there can add up uh, some people say it's a way to increase profitability I like that answer I like the fourth one though the one that says improve production health and or reproduction I think that's what additives are going to do for you to enhance the existing diet so I don't think I'd check all of the above here I think I would take number four if I was going to pick them at this stage of the game so uh, basically, we're going to cover today the four R's in selecting feed additives. How do you measure variation? This gets to be a little heavy duty, but hang on, you farmers. Uh, you have to understand this. Then we're going to get down to my uh, additives list, and I break it into three different categories. And then we'll finish up with additive update in the sprint round, as you'll see here in just a minute. So we get at the four R's, and here they are, uh, response, return, research, and results. So uh, we're going to open up the polling question now. Jim, are you going to open that up? 
And basically, the poll is now open, and the question you have 30 seconds to answer and says, well, which of these R's are most important? If you're going to pick one R, is it the response, the economic return, the research on the additive, or results on the farm? So uh, it is now open, and we are often voting at this stage of the game. At this point, we've got about... Uh, uh, almost 70 of you online, very good, and we have over half of you voted. Uh, go quicker now. Once we get to about 67%, we shut you off at this stage of the game. And uh, we think we got, uh, looks like we got a, a few more stragglers coming in here. These Republicans are a little slow today. They'll have to speed up on the next one. Let's go ahead and close the, the poll here. And Jim, can you show that to our people? And the polling is coming up here, and they're seeing what I'm seeing now. Uh, 4% say anticipated response. Uh, number 40% of you say the economic return. Uh, I, I think that's an important factor. And, and on it, in fact, probably would be my first choice. Research got a nice strong 22%. Results on the farm about 35%. So all three R, three of the four R's did well except for response. That surprised me a little bit. So let's go on to our next PowerPoint. And uh, let's talk about each of these response, what these four responses are, at least as I look at them. Uh, to me, this one's very important. It's an important one. I thought I'd get more votes on that one because it basically says, why are you putting product Z in? Are you expecting one of these things to happen? If you don't know what the response is, you and I have no business messing around adding that uh, feed added to the feeding program. And this is just a partial list. If you go to our feeding guide, which is uh, published by Horst Dairyman, you'll see there's probably four 14 or 15 other total reasons why you could look at a response on a farm. Certainly that's important. I'm going to add sodium bicarb because it's going to enhance dry matter intake. That's what I'm looking for. That's not a butterfat test. That's what I'm looking for. The second R is return. And certainly my thumb rule is two to one. So I like to see if I'm going to spend two cents on a feed add, a penny on a feed additive, I want to get two cents back. And that's because uh, the second bullet point, some of the target animals don't uh, are, are, are received the product. Uh, a good example might be uh, niacin. Niacin would have a role in early lactation. Mid-lactation cows, not sure there's much benefit with niacin out there in the program. Rumen protected choline would probably fit in that category as well. So certainly uh, in Illinois, with my average herd size, about 126 cows, many times when I feed it to the lactating herd, everybody gets in the lactating herd, not just the target animals as far as that goes. Some of the responses may not be a direct economic Economic response, meaning I don't sell it every day in the bulk tank. Uh, some feed additives improve hoof health. Uh, some may have some impact on reproductive performance, which indirectly will in have some economic response, but it may take nine months to clip that reproductive response. It may take six months to, cl to clip that hoof response as far as that goes. And of course, uh, the, the, the meter is always running. So my response is, uh, this was your, was your most popular R of the, the voters that are out there. Uh, this simply shows you a breakdown chart looking at a feed additive and we'll just pick a uh, bicarb yeast culture would fall into this category as well somewhere around that six cents per cow per day and at $17 milk and unfortunately uh, that we uh, were uh, just three months ago we were on the left side and we got some Canadian colleagues in and they're smiling because we we're up in Canada and, and they got a very strong milk price up there but you can see if this is bicarb at six cents per cow per day I'm getting $17 for our milk and certainly our class 3 milk price is below that, but we're going to get that in Illinois because of the higher components and quality premiums we have. I need to get four tenths of a pound of milk uh, to recover the cost of the sodium bicarb. And so that might be your guideline. You simply say, well, i got to make sure I get my money back. Uh, that's right. Only the federal government, I guess the state of Illinois, can borrow more, can borrow more money than what they can pay off, but basically most dairy farms cannot do that. The third one is research, and uh, we can uh, look at three things on the research side. Now, we'll see if anybody's really smart, if they can identify our two grad students here. Uh, this picture was taken a few years ago, but we'll see who's smart. Anybody recognize these are two of Dr. Drakeley's finest grad students we had here at the University of Illinois. We'll let you type them in. Anyway, uh, the research needs to be controlled, which means you've got cows that are on the study and cows that are not on the study, because certainly if we do a study and it's 80 
degrees, suddenly the whole herd drops or the dry matter changes, we've got to be able to pick that up. Uh, it should be unbiased, and that's why a lot of the research you'll see published comes from land-grant colleges as far as that goes. Holy cow, we got a, we got a winner. we got a winner. we got a winner. Heather Dan. Heather Dan is a young lady on the right. Tim Schneider, congratulations. You will getting, you'll be getting something in the mail. It could be a bill, but you'll be getting something in the mail. That research should be unbiased, and that's why a lot of uh, companies need to go to land-grant colleges. The bad news is, just so you're aware of that, if you're going to come to the University of Illinois and do a total lactation study with 40 cows, I better have about 40 or $50,000 in your checking account because it's uh, pretty expensive research. And then finally, statistically analyzed. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a few minutes, but statistically means that <clears throat> if there is a three-pound difference, is it real? What's the probability that you're going to see it on your farm? So that's awfully important. Neil Douglas is another good-looking dude sitting over here, and he's teaching actually at a, at a university in the eastern part of the United States. Now, a lot of you picked the fourth R, which are results, and I, I concur. I, you know, really, in my view, any feed additive you have has to have all four R's. We just thought we'd just kind of see kind of what the what the listeners were thinking at this stage of the game. So it says if you're going to put in, uh, you're going to put in, let's uh, pay, say, a yeast culture, then what are you going to be looking at? What are you going to be, a yeast product, what are you going to be looking at? DHI records to, to assert, did your cows, because, you know, just because the University of Wisconsin says cows can understand this stuff, or University of Illinois or Cornell, it doesn't work unless it's on your farm. So do you have records, health records, reading charts, uh, something in uh, PC Dart, uh, uh, Dairy Comp uh, 300, whatever the case is that you can actually prove really what you are. And Tim Schneider, here's your last chance. There's another young lady down here that is was one of our very good grad students as well, and we'll see if you can identify her. I bet you you don't get her down here uh, as well, but she again is one of our really good students and now is employed actually at the University of Illinois as a regional uh, extension specialist. So that takes care of the four R's. B bottom line take-home report. You need to have all four of them there when you pick a product. Now let's talk a little bit about variation. And while I'm not a very good statistician, we're going to talk about two ways you're going to see when people talk to you about feed additives or in some cases even fat, protected fat products or even amino acid sources. Type 1, type 2 air, and meta-analysis. And it's my goal for having you to understand what these two are because you should be asking this because a number of the products now have that. A type 1 air is very simply that you fed the, the feed additive in, in today's case, but you got no milk response or component response. Your cows must have grown up in Minnesota. They're kind of dumb. They're kind of dumb cows. That's for Lucas's benefit. The type 2 air simply says there was a milk response on the farm, but you're like Hutchins, a tight Dutchman, and decides not to feed it. You're just too miserly as far as that goes, and you, were, and you did not feed it. That's called a type 1 and type 2 airs. Each of them will have an economic impact. You see here in just a minute. So this is what Dave Galligan sent to me and Dave Galligan, Norman St. Pierre, Randy Shaver, these are people who do these type analyses, they're very good statisticians and what they simply do is they look at all the research uh, on the information, in most cases that's journal published, they do a partial budget analysis on it, they do a sensitivity analysis on it, so therefore an animal, a study that has 60 animals on it will have more power than an animal that has six animals on it, uh, certainly the, 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 uh, the, the degree house control and then they put it through a, a, a software program that analyzes this. And again, Bill Sanchez, if you really want an explanation, just Google Bill Sanchez on SPAC and you'll find a really nice paper that will walk you through that very, very nicely. We're just going to look at bicarb today as our example. Uh, here there are 15 journal articles. The milk response, look at the variation, folks. Pretty big variation there. That's a factor. So the more variation, the more cows it takes to get to, uh, to, to really determine the response. Uh, the increase in dry matter, so bicarb drive dry matter intake, as you can see, and the cost of the product somewhere is around a nickel at this stage of the game. You develop a response curve, so this is your bell-shaped response curve based on all those 15 studies. You can see right here about 3.3 pounds is the top of the bell-shaped curve. Now, if you're from Illinois, you want to always be over here. In other words, you want your cows to really read this and understand that and even get a better response. But if you're in Minnesota, Lucas, you can, some of these dumb cows don't understand that or they don't respond. So obviously uh, some of the research says not all cows respond, others say it does. And so the shape of that curve, the height of that curve becomes an important factor. 
So these are the studies. Uh, there was actually 15 uh, rather than 12 here. That's the level of bicarb, the cost that was done by back when um, uh, Dr. Galligan did the work, uh, $13 milk, $0.07 cent dry matter. Of course, today we're looking at $0.17 cent milk and about uh, 14 or $0.13 cents for dry matter. So obviously this analysis only applies to this data. Got that, folks? Understand that. So you actually have four choices here. And Jim Balls has made it very, very colorful. The first choice is correct. You fed by carb and your cows responded. That's a correct decision. There's another green decision up here, and that is you do not feed the by carb and you're below break even. What do you mean, Mike? Well, maybe you're feeding 15 or 20 pounds of baled hay. Maybe you're averaging a 50 pound tank average. In other words, you're not putting a lot of pressure on the rumen, and the rumen pH is being handled very nicely by the cow producing your own by carb, or we're not feeding that hard, high energy, or a uh, finely chopped processed product. The third air is uh, type 1 air. There it is. Type 1 air says, I fed the bicarb, but my cows did not cover cost. It was not a profitable decision. The type 4, as you already saw, and you're going to see several more of these, but we won't walk through them nearly at this extent. I did not feed the bicarb, but son of a gun, my cows would have figured it out. And so now we come in with a value. So your type 1 air costs you a nickel a day. A nickel a day for not, in other words, you fed it, you lost the bicarb. These do not match the price of the product. So just you'll see that here in just a minute. It says, had you fed it, though, that would have been 30 cents a day. So now you've got the numbers. You've got the numbers. And so if you're a, if you're a dairy farmer, you say, it's a little pretty good bet. It looks like I had a pretty good bet. I should be l at least looking at that, considering that if I should feeding it out to the program. And again, as I said, some trials drive this number more than others. Now let's move to another feed added. This is niacin. And in fact, when you get to the speed round, this is what you're going to see. And you're, I'm not going to walk you through. We could actually spend uh, 20 minutes on each of these feed additives. We we break this out, and it's in the Hordes Dairyman Guide booklet. It's also will be on the PowerPoints you'll see at the end. What is the function? What does niacin do? So here it's all listed. It says what level should you be feeding? And basically, you can see the the six gram, 12 gram, and the answer. From Randy Shavers, do not feed the six gram. That is not biologically enough. You got to feed 12 grams of rumen unprotected, or come in with three and three. And if I was going to highlight that, that is what I would be looking at right there. Three grams protected, rumen protected. Three grams of unprotected. Unprotected means it has some function in the rumen microbes. This simply means we got to get it to the lipid site as far as that goes. Here's your cost from the rumen unprotected, a penny per gram. This is the benefit to cost ratio, three to one at the 12 gram level, three to one. Remember, we want a two to one, so that R looks pretty good. Strategy is when you would feed it, and you'll see what this means in a minute, what evaluated it would mean. We put this up here because going to the next PowerPoint, we're going to show you a meta analysis. Now, Dr. Schwab, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, Eric Schwab, and uh, Randy Shaver have published this in the Professional Animal Science Journal. They looked at 27 studies, all of it on the rumen unprotected, and here's what they found. N this six gram was not effective. Now that's a very important finding as far as that goes because it tells you you dairymen are going to look at this product you are going to pull the trigger at the 12 gram level or the three and three you mentioned earlier. This is the milk response here's the stats a, a, a probability 0 0.06 so it means about uh, on the average uh, six times out of 100 cases uh, your cows uh, are not going to respond. Look at the range uh, you can see very wide range and it was kind of unique because Illinois had most of the high numbers here and maybe we have smart cows or who knows what but look at the range out here you can see there's an increase in milk fat very highly significant a trend on milk protein a small trend on feed efficiency we talked about and they reported 54 percent of the studies would break even at one cent per day so that's a, that that is what we would call a meta-analysis we look at all the information we summarize it for you you can look at the hard data on terms of ranges and averages let's look at the type 1 type 2 air and we're going to click through these very quickly. So here we go. We know those two are correct. We know there's your type 1, type 2 air. And here comes economics. So now, do you see a totally different profile? Almost trading dollars there, saying, well, you know, if I didn't feed it, I'd probably say 14 cents. So I did feed it, and they figured it out it was 20 cents. Yeah, and so I went back to Dr. Galligan and said, you know, uh, is there should be a ratio here? And he said, no, there's no ratio. That is what the numbers are. You, as a dairy farmer, as a consultant, as a feed company specialist, this is what you look at and you base your decisions on some of this kind of information.
Here comes your yeast culture and yeast products. Again, you can see the breakdown on that. All this is going to be sitting on your on the PowerPoint with um, uh, that that uh, or uh, will be on the website, the archive. So remember, uh, uh, Lucas told you this will be on the website probably in the next day or two. You can walk through here on the four break uh, the six breakdowns on that product as well. Notice the one thing is we do recommend that you think now remember that here in just a minute. Here comes uh, their analyses. Uh, this is uh, some work put together. Fifty one different studies. The mean increase is 3.3 pounds, very similar to bicarb. Notice there's your bell-shaped curve again at this point, and you can see the, some of the studies showed no response. A lot of studies showed a lot of this very typical 3-4 pound response as far as that goes, and a statistical probability at 91 percent uh, of the response is going to be above a break-even as far as that goes. This is another uh, interesting data set because they broke it out by university which are in red, the red ones, and the, and the blue ones happen to be the, all the studies. So now you can see that this, uh, the, this product broke it out looking at a controlled research studies, published in journal studies, and these would be in-house, third-party, uh, those kinds of tests there. So again, be asking that, you know, of these 51 studies, you can see here about 40% were university-based, 60% were, for lack of a better word, in-house, third-party, as far as that goes. And you can see some differential response responses in terms of from the with the university studies found versus the, the other studies here. So here we go again. Hang on to your hats, kids, and away we go. And we're off and running again. And now you're going to see a third profile. Take a look at this one. And you can see now that the type 1 air is only a penny a day. And some of you out there are going to be like I am. You're saying, now, what is this? If I, if, I, if I fed the yeast culture, it's going to cost me three, four, five, six, seven cents a day, and it's only going to cost me penny wise, and that is a statistical analysis based on probability, number of studies, and response of cows. So this is not always just the product cost. This could be higher or lower than the product cost as illustrated here. You can see the return here is 35. So I guess if you're going to go to Vegas and you're going to, you're going to play some, uh, some, some, some additive game there, this is the one you want to play because you got a little better chance of winning on this one uh, than compared to the other two we showed here just a bit earlier as far as that goes as well. Okay, here comes Monenzen. Again, we're breaking that on down to that same breakdown. Uh, we'll let you read this. In fact, you're going to have to come back. So uh, so I, I guess, uh, Patty and Lucas, I'm going to try to build my archives here because uh, you should read through this. Uh, I want to emphasize level. You really got to be sure you're feeding enough of this to get the response with the feed additive. And you can look at your cost-benefit ratios here as well. I thought I would sneak in a fairly new study. They're looking at level. Some of you may not have seen this. This is a study that was uh, uh, abstracted at ADSA back a couple years ago. And here you can see the level of rumenzin, and this is the control cows, 300 milligrams, 450 milligrams, 600 milligrams a day. And so, and by the way, these are all legal. Uh, you can go on a uh, top dress or individual feeding base up to 660 milligrams. Most of you are going to be around this 300 milligram, which is the, uh, the, the, the 11, uh, the 11, uh, 11, mil, uh, 11 grams per, per ton. Anyway, when we come down through here and you can see quickly two or three important things and you again you probably want to come back and study this but you can see on dry matter we saw an increase in dry matter with the uh, with the product now these are fresh cows Remember that. These are cows in early lactation, a response in dry matter intake. And that's what we like to see with Romenzin in early lactation. In late lactation, you will not see that. You will see a decrease in dry matter intake. But look at here, folks, a nice increase in further dry matter intakes. Look at the milk production responses. You can see here a, 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 a nice response, but now you all see a little bit of change in butterfat test here. So that's you can see on fat corrected base, we didn't see much. Look at this number over here. Big time number. Big time number. Notice we get to the really high levels over here. We lose, we lose some of that benefits. So take a look at that. But the number one you look at is right here. Notice ketones. Look at now. Remember Dr. Etzel's talk we had here just about two months ago on on ketones. Look what happens when we're adding this additive. We really drop this down. And I would probably suggest one of the reasons we're seeing this very nice response on dry matter intake is because we're having a much better job controlling borderline ketosis in these cows. So take home message here is what level are you feeding? About one out of five dairymen at my meetings know that answer. So maybe for you dairymen, that's your take home message. Are you at 250, 300, 350, 400? We have some in Indiana at 500 milligrams. You say, why does they do that? Because the response is linear. The response is linear on these cows. 
Now, the Canadian folk did a very nice job. Uh, Dr. Dumfield uh, cited down here. They did a beautiful net analysis. And again, it says 36, look at this, folks, 36 papers, 10,000 cows, except for uh, uh, bovine somatotrope and RBST. This is probably the most highly researched product that we have here in, uh, that has been done here in, in North America. And you can see, if you look at all these studies, a slight decrease in dry matter. That's where the feed efficiency comes into play. About 1.6 pounds more milk. You see a slight decrease in butter fat, no effect on protein, and improvement on feed efficiency. That's what you should see on your farm at this stage of the game. And we looked at this point, and a slight increase in, in body condition score. Notice we also change the volatile fatty acids around here in the rumen. Uh, excuse me, the milk fat. I'll get it right here, Mike. My, my, the butter fat changed a little bit, and that's because the rumensin has an impact on VFA production in the rumen itself. So certainly that powerful net meta-analysis. Here comes another another research paper. It's a different paper, and now they look at the metabolic analysis on these animals. And now you can see uh, some of these studies will overlap, and now we only, we only have 4,000 cows. I use the word only 4,000. That's a boatload of cows. Notice a nice decrease in beta-hydroxybutyric acid. That's your ketone body that really is a smoking gun. And you can see a reduction in ketone bodies. He, both of these are ketone bodies. NIFAs, that's your uh, mobilized, so it decreases mobilized body fat, increase in blood glucose, and it didn't change the others. So again, another way to look at the data. So if you're a farmer and nutritious consultant, you can actually see, rather than just look at one study or four studies, look at the 59 different studies. Then the Canadian folks did another study, and they looked at methods of uh, feeding this product here, and this stands for control release capsule, not legal in the United States. Uh, basically, it's a tremendous way to deliver uh, a monenzin uh, to dairy cattle in, in Canada, especially for dry cows. It's a no-brainer. But you can see the capsule and top dressing was more effective based on their meta-analysis than feeding through a TMR. And if you think of monenzin trying to get a, a continuous 24-7 flow, you can see why this sucker always wins, always wins. You can see the best bang for your buck, transition early lactation, although the data supports total lactation. It's interesting, some of you online, very effective product on pasture win, and also you can see high forage diets give a better response than low forage diets, and as you can be appreciated, some of you know that, we affect the gram positive microbes, so therefore the high forage diets tend to protect this a little bit and, and keep those bacteria a little more happier. So again, depending on the type of diet you're feeding. Boy, what a beautiful analysis. I think if you saw these last five points, you could then decide, is this a feed additive that should work on your farm? And so, Jim, that gets us to our next part. And um, there is a question we'll answer at the end here. Uh, we'll take all those questions at the end. So go ahead and type them in. Uh, we'll welcome them. Uh, we'll grab them at the end. There will be time. So we we'll now start looking at, we talked about how do you look at, at the four R's? Uh, wh what type of data should you be looking at? And now we're going to look at evaluating feed additives. And you already you saw this. So we take, we've taken every additive that's in the Horge Dairyman Guide and we, add, and we break it out on these six different levels. Function, level, cost, benefit to cost ratio, this should be two to one. Strategy, when would I recommend feeding it? And status, when do you recommend it? And so go back and take a look at that. Every one of you dairymen, every one of you nutritionists, every one of you consultants, you have to have this in your in your in your toolkit as far as that goes and then take a look at it as well. By the way, if you're really smart, you would know who this extension director here is at Illinois. He's now retired along with this handsome dude as well. So we looked at this and we broke our feed and into four categories. The first one is recommended. It says recommended as needed. Now don't lose sight of this word here, as needed. Remember, just because bicarb and some of these other ones have a really good track record, you may not need it depending on your feeding program, your feeding methodology, uh, the type of diet you're feeding, and maybe the level of milk production you're getting. Recommended. Experimental simply says, boy, these, this product's pretty neat. Ah, it's kind of interesting. We just need to get more research on this. So some of our new feed additives really fall in this experimental category simply say we are not recommending it across the board to our dairymen in Illinois. Evaluative simply says you're on your own. And I'll give you an idea. Niacin fits right into this one right here. Niacin. Uh, protected choline would fit into this one here. Rumenzin would fit into the one that was recommended. Evaluative because you saw the range. You saw the type 1, type 2 air. Recommended says usually we don't have the four R's there. And the one that's missing usually is the economics are tight or the research isn't there yet. So basically, we do have some additives that fall into that category, not recommended. And again, the Hordes Derriman booklet has all those listed. 
So we're going to start looking at, at various feed additives that we can take a look at. And we are going to look at another polling question, Jim. So let's go ahead and turn this on here. And we're going to say you only pick one. Only pick one. So you get to vote for one additive and only one. This is not Chicago. You can't vote twice. You can't vote three times. And we're off and running at this stage of the game. And we got 25% of our votes in. So we, I guess we got the Democrats in. And uh, now we'll be getting the, the Romney vote. will be coming in here uh, slowly kind of the outline districts at this stage of the, of the game uh, our Canadians I know they'll, they'll be voting slower and it's kind of interesting what's happening here is we'd say we've got uh, uh, about uh, two-thirds of the vote in we'll give you another uh, 10 or 15 seconds to get a few stragglers here at this stage of the game we're very excited we have 84 people online today so folks thanks for coming uh, hopefully we we will reward you for your time for uh, for sitting in with us at this point uh, Jim uh, let's close her up and let's let our people take a look at that. And Jim is moving this around now and let's see what you voted on. A quarter of you said room and buffers. Another quarter of you said yeast culture, yeast products. 40% uh, of you picked rumenzin. 10% picked side inoculants. And 3% of you picked organic trace minerals. Really interesting. Really interesting. Well, let's move on and say, what would I do? And, and, and it'd be kind of fun if this was a meeting, we could have some spirited discussions I can show you. So here is how I would pick them. We added a, a biotin. By the way, these, if I was consulting on your farm, I would have all these products in your feeding program in most cases, in most cases. Notice I broke it into four categories. The first one I call rumen impact. So in other words, if I, got, if I have a, a feed additive that impacts the rumen, I look at it very, very carefully because the rumen delivers 80% of the energy through volatile fatty, fatty acids. They can produce up to 60% of the amino acids based on some of the data that Chuck Schwab shared with us several months ago at this stage of game. So I want this rumen really working for me. So I ordered these three in the order that I would add them, rumenzin, it'd be my first choice as a rumen impactor, yeast and yeast culture it would be my second one, and sodium bicarb, s carb would be my third rumen impactor at this stage of the game. Now, some of you say, where's your probiotics, Hutchins? Well, more about that a little bit later on, hang on. Now, let's really play hardball. Here's Hutchins. My first choice is going to be Romenzen. And some of you say, well, that crook, that's because Elanco is sponsoring the meeting. No, it has nothing to do with it. Basically, Romenzen is my first choice. It's an antibiotic. I have no way to mimic Romenzen. There's no way I can mimic it. Then I'm slipping down here to my side inoculant is number two. I pick side inoculant as my number two because, again, I'm, anytime I can enhance forge quality and reduce dry matter loss, I'm all excited about it, and I can't, I can't change uh, some of my silage properties to get that job done. Some cases I can. Then I come down to my organic trace minerals, and that's, you'll notice, boy, I wouldn't have many votes there, but I'm a big fan of organic trace minerals. I'm looking at that's zinc, selenium, copper, and in some cases, chromium. Chromium is now legal in the U.S. to uh, be fed to cattle. All this has immunity screaming at me. So anything I can do to improve the immune system, the immune response, be it mammary, uterine, hoof, uh, respiratory system, I'm pretty excited about that. Notice not many of you were very excited about it. Now, you could also argue, Hutchins, this why, that's mineral, Hutchins. Having your nutrients doesn't meet your definition, so I'm cheating you a little bit. Then I come back to my yeast culture, yeast culture, and use products. Then I come to my sodium bicarb, and then I come to biotin. I'm a pretty big fan of biotin, especially when it's around six or eight or ten cents for 20 milligrams to get that job done uh, at this stage of the game. So those are my six. I'm not sure you want to agree with that. If you've got an argument with me, send me a question. We can argue that a bit later when the, in the Q&A period, which will open up here in about 10 minutes. We're in great shape on our webinar uh, uh, today. Okay, now here we go. Now here's my second list, my second list, and that is as needed. So my second list, my first list says I would recommend those to most of my dairy farms. This one says it depends, it depends. Propylene glycol, a tremendous drench product. In fact, first two products, and we're going to talk a little bit about drenching here as we wrap up here in just a few minutes. Great drenching products. So we have cows that can really respond, that need some glucose, need some blood calcium, and uh, you're going to be hearing more about calcium here in the future. Calcium at 
parturition becoming a new, uh, the new, uh, the new ketosis, uh, the new ketone uh, product. Anyway, niacin. If I had body condition score cows over three and a half. I would be adding niacin. So if you've got heavy dry cows and heavy heifers, I am going to uh, have that as well uh, listed for me. And this is my bias. So already you're seeing a Hutchins bias coming in here. This is the two products I'd be looking at if I had niacin. Microtoxin binders. If, in fact, you've got some risk of microtoxins, if you're in Pennsylvania, New York, there's a risk there because some of your corn products did have some, some microtoxins this year. We in Illinois were watching with all our heat that we had this summer in August for aflatoxin. We have not seen aflatoxin in Illinois, but it always can be a problem. And you can look at these kinds of products out there. Uh, a clay mineral would be the product for micro, uh, for aflatoxin. The yeast cell wall products with an N or without an enzyme would be, I'd be looking for my microtoxins like uh, zeralinone, T2, Don, and things like that. I'm getting lots of questions. That's exciting to see. Protected choline, if you and your vet are concerned that your ketosis is marginally high and we're seeing some lipid build up in the liver, some fatty liver, that's a no-brainer. Then that, that's going to cost you 30 cents a day. So that's got the big ticket item sitting here as well. But again, 15 grams of actual protected choline. Most of you will be feeding 50, 60 grams of the rumen protected product, and there are several of those on the market because of the carrier product. And on salts, it depends a bit on what your potassium levels are and where your DCAT is. If your potassium is over 1.2% or your DCAT is over plus 50, I think you got to look at it. I think you have to look at that product. And then again, acid-based preservatives. Uh, we're going to look at that in such cases for summer heat stress, for bunker stability. It could be for baled hay, propionic acid to prevent baled hay from heating. could be for some of your high-moisture corns that you're going to try to avoid some yeast of uh, yeast fermentation occurring and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and some molds as well. So it depends. If you got these opportunities, uh, risks on your farm, then I would go ahead and pull the trigger. Then I got my watch list. My watch list says these are guys and gals, eyes wide open. Some of these things are going to have some some impact. Essential oils, uh, any, somewhere in that one half to one and a half gram level. Randy Shaver has done a type one, type two. Uh, excuse me, he's done a meta analysis. Although that meta analysis only has six studies in it, but basically, uh, the essential oils will come confuse. And I bet you we had a comment from a, a, a colleague in the UK. They cannot use rumenza. Then essential oils become a look-alike. Uh, the reason we are not very excited about essential oils is because we can use rumensin. That'll cost me three cents a day. These products will cost me typically six, eight, twelve cents a day. The other problem I have on essential oils, since we're talking about it, is which essential oil or oil should I be looking at? And I have them available in the U.S., but nobody can tell me how many grams of, uh, if it's got to be garlic, if it's got to be cinnamon, uh, which ones I should be looking at. The the DFMs are truly interesting to me, and you know you got you got things like fast track and 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 uh, a priority one. You've got the the Chris Hansen products out there. Certainly, these are one we're going to watch. And again, I'm looking to ask which is the actual microbes will get their job done for me and be sure it's repetitive. Feed enzymes are going to come. In fact, we just saw last week a, a release from Denmark claiming they have an enzyme that's going to break down cellulose. So keep your eyes and ears open. If these, uh, if these uh, corn ethanol plants come up with a, an enzyme that can break down uh, corn stalver to make ethanol, you and I as nutritionists are going to get all excited because I'm going to put it in my feed because I can get out of the manure business. So if I can find an enzyme that I can make ethanol out of straw in corn stalks, by George, I'm putting that in my dairy cows because I'm going to break down some of that fiber that we can utilize as a source of energy for cows. Methionine hydroxy analog that can also be an amino acid source, but this is a methyl donor. A methyl donor, and that kind of competes a little bit with the uh, with methionine and also competes a little bit with the uh, choline product as far as that goes. And we're really watching chromium. We aren't seeing a lot of it in the Midwest yet. It is available. It is going to have some impact on insulin. It's going to have some impact on NEFAS. There's some nice work coming out of Michigan State on that one. So again, we're kind of watching this one here at this stage of the game. 
What's new in feed additives? Well, I get ahead of myself here a little bit from time to time. Uh, by carb, make sure you're feeding 0.75% of the ration dry matter. So if you're feeding by carb to your cows 10 years ago and you're feeding it today, then you should be feeding more of it because your cows gave more milk now than 10 years, years ago, I hope at least, and that means they're going to eat more dry matter, you should have more by carb. This is my free choice. This is my free choice by carb. So those of you that are free choicing by carb does not replace what's in the diet, does not replace on the diet, but put out their free choice. I would hope they would eat less than 50 grams a day. If you start seeing pretty big intakes there, then do a little cow watching. I would expect to see fresh cows, early lactation cows, heifers eating this as they're, they're going after some sodium here and may and trans, trans, transition diets. We cover the niacin already. Uh, this is some interesting do, uh, study done by one of the companies in which they took their, their data and did a meta-analysis and discovered they had a better response when a yeast culture product was top dressed because then you don't have to worry about it getting lost at, at, at close to the calving period. I think you're going to find our, our direct fed microbials. We're going to see DNA fingerprinting so we know that in fact these, this is the right microbe we're trying to feed here and we're ready to comment on the, on the cellulose product. Well, we're going to get ready to wrap up here in about uh, five minutes, so let's finish one more topic, and that is uh, drenching. And I'm um, going to ask again, kind of like the helpline here, Jim, let's do, oh, let's open up the polls. Jim, we're going to have Jim open up the polls, and uh, we're going to ask you, uh, drenching, and probably we should have had a fifth choice in there, and that don't recommend at all. Anyway, uh, t tell me if you're going to drench, what strategy would you use? And so we're opening up the polls, and we're off and running, drenching uh, at this stage of the game. We, uh, if we ever give this talk again, Jim, we'll put the fifth choice on, no drenching at all. But this is what I hear out in the field. These are four different philosophies as far as drenching cows. And we're a little slower here. We're, uh, although we do have, we're only at 30 seconds. We got almost 60% of the vote in. And we're off and running. And again, we appear to have two, two that are in big, uh, must be the Obama and uh, Romney vote here. Uh, looks like uh, the other two are in big trouble at this stage of the game. We are at almost 75% of the vote. And again, uh, uh, let's cut her off, Jim, and uh, see what we have here. Polls are close, and Jim's going to bring it up. And interesting, uh, we've got uh, one sixth of you, 16%, says we're going to drench them all. We're going to drench them all. Another 10% uh, said we're just going to drench the older cows. By the way, these are very pop. All these are popular in Illinois. 40% uh, of you say we are going to drench them uh, as needed. Basically, these are cows that may have had a problem before. And then uh, a third of you said we're going to use it to treat sick cows. Now, my comment would be, and I'll get in all kinds of trouble because a third of you are going to get mad at me, I think you're too late. I think if you're going to drench cows once they're sick, yes, you can try to help them out. But I think you got to get this into these cows right at calving, right at calving. We'll let you read that. There are two kinds of products on the marketplace. I call them, uh, I call it the caulking gun, the tube. Uh, you're talking about pints of very low volume. Here we're looking at power drenching. Power drenching means I'm going to start giving these cows gallons of water. And some of you are going to get nervous here at this point. I'm talking 10 gallons of water in the first drench. A lot of my people are at two and a half gallons of water. Why am I excited? You say down here, you say, why am I drenching cows? I'm going to rehydrate my cow. I'm going to, because most of my cows, at the, at the day they're calving, or certainly 12 hours before calving, they're not out there sucking down a lot of water. So they're going to a very stressful period. I'm going to rehydrate these cows. And in fact, some I like to see 15 gallons. And you say, my goodness, Hutchins, 15 gallons. 15 gallons is about 120 pounds of water, and I'm just trying to fill that hole up. Remember, I got a 80-pound, 90-pound calf, some membranes, some fluids, uh, all that coming out. I'm going to fill that hole up in this cow. Well, it's going to flush the rumen, flush out some of those nutrients, get them down to the lower, the lower gut, and hopefully uh, stimulate the cow to eat dry matter. And then when I'm flushing her, so that's the, that's my number one reason for drenching is to, is to, to, to rehydrate the cow. I'm going to put electrolytes in because she's lost some of those at calving. I'm going to put a glucose precursor in there to keep my blood glucose up, keep out of ketosis, and any rumen stimulants that gets this rumen off and running as far as that goes. Now, uh, you can see the cost of these products are quite variable. If you're going to build this one, it's going to cost you probably at least three and a half to five bucks. I mean, some of these products are not cheap, so if, you're, if your product's up around eight or ten dollars, don't be grumbling too much. It's probably going to be worth its value. Wisconsin did some nice research drenching with rumen fluid. If uh, I would suggest anybody who's got 400 cows or more, they 
you should have a fistulated cow always available in the herd where they can take a gallon of rumen fluid, strain it through a cheesecloth, and drench her down. Drench her down because it'll really help these six cows, sick cows that are off feed to re, re, repopulate the rumens as far as that goes. If we're going to rehydrate, then I use smaller volumes. I think we're looking more at that two to three gallon level at this point. The first big drench, power drench, is to really fill this cow up as far as that goes. Okay, now we're going to go look at a mixture. Dr. Jesse Goff, many will recognize that name from um, uh, Iowa State the Diagnostic Lab over there at Iowa State. He's back there now. We're pleased to see him. This is a recipe he gave me a couple years ago, so it's got a little age on it, but he said, if you're going to put this together, here we go. A pound of calcium propionate or, that should be or, that's okay, uh, uh, three to five hundred milligrams of propylene glycol. That is your glucose precursor. I like this product because it brings me calcium. It brings me very biologically available calcium. So if there were me, I'd probably go a half a pound of calcium propionate and 250, 300 milligrams of uh, propylene glycol as a liquid. Here's this is my yeast culture, a rumen stimulant, electrolyte. Uh, this is if you got low blood phosphorus, your vet would be able to tell you that, pulling some cows. Magox or mag sulfate here, primarily to get some magnesium into these cows. Again, because some milk fever related things look a little bit like, uh, like a, a magnesium shortage. And here's another electrolyte. I put this on to say if you're going to build one, this is kind of a, a not, not a bad guideline. Notice there's no alfalfa hay in there, no alfalfa leaf meal. And that's because I'd rather feed that as a pound of hay rather than grind it up and put it through a pump so it's green. But a lot of guys want green. So I guess if you want green, I'd use some food coloring I like to do on the Chicago River at St. Patrick's Day. No alfalfa leaf meal on this one here at all because it's just going to bugger up my drench gun, and I'd rather feed that. Now, if you are buying a commercial product, back into this number. And we've done that in a couple of a couple of our workshops, and we had a very popular product that says feed a scoop of it. And when we looked at the tag, worked it backwards, three scoops. Want to feed three scoops to get very close to this type of level. So again, again, just be aware. That's the reason I show this. Those of you who got a commercial product, how close are you to these numbers? And if you're going to build one, get out your pocketbook. But this would be kind of the levels you'd be looking at out there in, in the program. Okay, we are now uh, done. Uh, here's what's happening. Uh, we're going to go through these feed additive updates, and you'll see them all pop up on you. Uh, and here's the first one, uh, DCAD, and we're not going to talk them. But Jim says, if I don't show them, you can't find them. So here comes anionic salts, and there's some nice discussion about anionic salts you can take a look at. And this is from Dave Beatty, showing why calcium is so very, very important. And I said, this is the new, this is the new research area. Here come your micro toxin binders. We'll t we talked about them a bit earlier uh, here at this stage of the game. It has some signs on microtoxins. These are the levels we look at in our, at the University of Illinois, our veterinary school, as far as levels in the total ration dry matter. Here's your side inoculants. Again, you can see the breakdown at this stage of the game. And this is the rumen profile from Randy Shaver and Lehman Kong. What a good inoculant should do, you should be seeing these types of pHs and VFA patterns. Here comes beta keratin. Then we come into choline, rumen protected choline with the six steps in it. Here comes your enzymes. I split those. These are fibrolytic enzymes. And notice these are experimental. These are your starch enzymes. Randy Shaver has done some interesting work on this product at this point. Notice they are defining the amylase. There's a type of a measurement on those. Here comes your biotin product that we recommend. Here comes your probiotics that we taught, mentioned a bit earlier. Here comes your essential oils. You can look at your leisure. Here comes calcium propionate. We talked about it as drenching. Here comes uh, an immune stimulation product, the Omnigen AF product. You want to look back at that one. We added this one last year. We think this is an interesting one. It's still experimental for us. We find it interesting. Here comes prebiotics. Noel Leatherland pulled this data together. Here looking at some of your moss products, some of your uh, uh, other carbohydrates here. So these are not live. They're dead. But here are some numbers there for you. Here comes uh, probiotics again. I guess we got that one in twice, Jim. Here comes uh, your zinc methionine product coming into play. And with that, uh, we are um, uh, pretty well done at this stage of the game. So um, um, that's an interesting PowerPoint I got here, Jim. Uh, so we're going to open this up to questions. Questions? You didn't see what I saw, did you? We move on. We'll have questions. We've got a whole bunch of them. We'll go through these very quickly. But in the meantime, uh, perhaps, uh, Corey, you want to uh, mention uh, th this one uh, before we start losing people? 
Maybe Corey, Lucas, maybe Lucas, you should do this. Why would yeah, I say can you Corey? hear me? Ah, I can hear you. Maybe you want to say a few things about our next webinar and kind of what, wrap up the formal part of the program. Sure. Uh, can you hear me there? Um, the next webinar is May 14th, as you can see, brought to you by Mark, and that's me with Mike Van Amber from Cornell, and he's going to be talking about the long-term impacts of cat feeding. I think that'll be, obviously, that's a hot topic, and, and everyone cares about calves, whether you're raising them yourselves or, or you're having a grower do them. Calves are always the future of your herd, so uh, we're looking forward to that. Okay, well, very good. Well, we're in pretty good shape here. We have uh, about 10 minutes left to answer questions, and Jim is going to bring them, uh, cascade them down at this stage of the game, and we'll, we'll answer these rather, rather rapid firely here and keep you, uh, keep you on task as far as that goes. Uh, we are going to go, um, Let's go to the top one. Is there a difference between dead and live yeast? And the answer is, it depends on on whose research you're looking at. Um, you've got basically products that are only live yeast. You have products that are only yeast cell cultures. A uh, yeast uh, yeast culture basically means the yeast were grown on the product and then they secreted into the culture uh, what they call uh, neutrophil uh, neutra neutral like neutral like products. And um, I'm not. Say that word quite right, but it'll come as I get older. And then there are pr companies out there that have both of them. In other words, they have the guaranteed live yeast and they've got the yeast culture. And so also the an the answer is yes. There's a difference. There's a difference. Uh, is one better than the other? Uh, Peter Robinson did a, a study a number uh, several years ago using Journal of Dairy Science, and he found that all three of those type products had beneficial responses as far as that goes at this stage of the game. Uh, Jim has highlighted another. Another one, uh, monensin sensitivity in yeast and probiotic products, eyes wide open. My understanding that the rumensin does not have an impact on the yeast products, at least the companies I have talked with. Now, if one of the, if they're online, jump in here ASAP and straighten me out. Uh, usually, uh, my understanding is they are not sensitive to the monensin or the rumensin product. Probiotics, eyes wide open. Uh, the rumensin product affects gram-positive uh, bacteria. That's how it works. So if your probiotic is a gram-positive, it's going to have some impact. Not sure it's always going to kill them because we've discovered that you can feed rumensin to dairy cows and still make a, uh, you can still make a methane, a produce methane in methane generators as far as that goes so if you got a probiotic make sure you check with your with your your salesperson the, the company to find out that there is no um, negative effects using the romanzin along with the probiotic as far as that goes another question would you feed 100 percent organic trace minerals at a lower le recommended level than the nrc and the answer is i think i would I think whoever asked this question is a bit ahead of the curve at this stage of the game. Our, our take is that uh, on selenium, let's go product specific, on selenium, and I think there's an article going to pop up in Hordes Dairyman in a, another issue or two about this. Uh, selenium, I, in my dry cows, would be all organic. I want to make really sure there's no interference with iron or calcium or some other mineral or product in the diet that's going to tie it up. So I'm going to go all organic selenium, my three or four milligrams are going to be all organic. Then in my lactating cows, I'm going to then complement that three or four uh, milligrams of organic with three or four milligrams of inorganic. So I'm going to mix and match them as far as that goes. I think you're going to see us as we, we need more research from the, our companies to help us to make sure we're okay. But if they're going to be 60, 70 percent more biologic available, we should be able to reduce the level. And the one that comes to mind is quicker is copper. Uh, there are some people now monitoring copper levels in soil and also plant tissue. And because of both the copper we feed and the pig people are really people that really uh, go after it with uh, with, with a, a added uh, added product copper and all our foot bass uh, EPA is going to start looking at this and say are we getting our levels too high in soil and runoff as far as that goes so the answer is yes I think you'll see in the future that we're going to feed perhaps maybe half as much or I think uh, depending on the biologic availability that our companies will have to tell us maybe even a third as much and make it a little cheaper and also not build up some of these higher levels 
levels as far as that goes. Does remensin have effect on body condition score? Yes, sir. It sure does. If you go back, I was racing through that. If you look at the, the meta-analysis, it will increase body condition score because it increases energy dynamics, especially in mid and late lactation cows. So their meta-analysis says, yes, it does impact body condition score. Would not surprise me, depending on how much milk they're giving and stage of lactation. Uh, what is the ideal way to opt for whether organic is fed or inorganic at a particular stage of lactation? I think we covered that one pretty well. I, I think the organics are critical uh, as immune function. So I think in the dry cow transition, fresh cows, if I were going to do it, I had my organic sitting all the way until the cow's pregnant. And once the cow's pregnant, then I would be comfortable taking all, all the organics out. Now, that's pie in the sky in Illinois, because that means I got to have about uh, four or five different groups of cows. So uh, if you can't do that, then then I would keep some organics in the lactating, all organics in my uh, in my all selenium. And uh, basically, on the, the zinc, copper, uh, especially zinc and copper, we're replacing about a third of it, 25 to a third of it with the organic sources in the lactating ration. And again, we are not taking anything out. Uh, I think you want to play a hardball with me. We could at this stage of the game. Folic answer. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I'm going to take a bind. That. It's got to be from my, my, my Canadian colleagues. There is some research on, on folic acid as just what they said uh, up in Canada. And... Uh, um, I don't know. I'll be very honest with you. I, I just don't dare say anything because it, it would be just a swag. So I guess now I'm gonna have to go back and Google that, Jim. At this ideal dose of rumen fluid, I think I think you got to go a half gallon. I'm not sure anybody t t uh, uh, did it. Uh, uh, did it uh, done dose levels? The Wisconsin study did on off feed cows. They did a gallon. Got a very good response. So I guess since you're not buying rumen fluid, suck out a little bit more. But I'd be no less than a half gallon and at least a gallon as far as that goes on the rumen fluid. Did I hear you? Right, large herds should keep officially at cows and donor cow for sick cows. Yes, sir. You heard me right. You heard me right. And there is one in Illinois. There's one in Illinois that has a donor cow. And he, they're milking 800 cows in the St. Louis milk market. Uh, my big 3,000 cow herd does not do it. Obviously, if you're not going to fight that, <laughs> if you're not going to, you know, suck the juice out because you out of, your, out, out of your donor cow, strain it and then drench it, then and then you're just wasting your time. But we had a donor cow in Minnesota live to be 18 years old. As long as you get the pus sucker pregnant, you know. Well, she's going to be a very viable cow for you. Uh, we have no problem. We're always running a, a dozen or so officially to cows here. And as long as we get them pregnant, they live a long, long life. What is your recommendation as far as using clays or the yeast cells uh, there? Basically, my recommendation is the the the, the, the yeast cells like like the Nova Cell type products. I'd use that for the aflatoxin and and that. Uh, and I'd be looking at the yeast yeast cell binders for the uh, what I call the cold the cold microtoxins, uh, the T twos, the Dons, the Zeralinones, those where I'd be using for the hot uh, microtoxins. I'd be looking at bentonite and or the uh, the Nova Cell type product with a one group TMR what would you recommend uh, remensin rate I think you'd I think you're going to texture you're going you're, you're, you're going to titrate that in you're going to be around uh, to, uh, the 300 milligram level and if the butterfat test is solid for you being Holsteins or jerseys whatever breed you have I'd bring them up at the rate of maybe 30 to 40 milligrams and, and so let them sit there for about two or three weeks and then follow my butterfat test and I just walk them on up so I, I'd be I'm guessing most of my herds in Illinois are between three or four hundred milligrams and uh, nutritionists and consultants veterinarians who are really watching these herds careful enough you could even go higher I do have a herd in Illinois that's Jersey and obviously 250 milligrams is all the higher they can go they're very very sensitive to it I have no idea why would you like adders on, on the cat what uh, do you like adders on the calf side you betcha um, uh, say in the milk or all, or go all natural. I, I, uh, my organic people are not like me. Uh, I think we have a, we in Illinois need a coccidiostat in my milk, uh, milk replacer or in my whole milk. And you can do that now at that stage of game. I want my yeast, uh, yeast cultures. Those are, those are grass listed. I think those are organic. You could use the yeast cultures, but I think their, uh, their, their products will look really, really good, uh, at this stage of the game. And, and once we get to three months of age, Rumenzin is screaming, screaming at me as a coccidiostat. You may even want to use it in younger calves at this point. By the way, I'd also think the probiotic is no is a no-brainer on calves, but be careful if you're going to be using a, uh, a rumenzin-type product. Uh, but I, I, we have some data here that calves on milk, uh, I'd, be, I'd be adding a research-based probiotic to them as far as that goes.
Uh, do you uh, want to be sure I understand you correctly? Are you recommending drenching all fresh cows? Recipe you outlined it. I would not. I would not drench my heifers, and I would be in that third category. I would be looking at cows that had had a history of, of problems, like they've had milk fever or they, they had a, a bout, or my older cows. I know a, a lady who uh, who's now retired. They they would uh, they were actually giving a bottle of calcium and a bottle of glucose to every cow, third lactation above. Well, I think drenching is a little safer than IVing those cows, although I know there is a little risk with that. So my answer is I would be uh, I'd, I wouldn't be drenching heifers unless they look like they're getting themselves in trouble. I think by the time you drench them and they're sick, they've got ketosis, now it's kind of like uh, insurance. I, I see drenching as insurance. And so the barn is burning down, it's a little late to buy fire insurance. And so when the cow is sick, I think I've lost some pretty valuable time. Any probiotic products that solve VA-induced as uh, acidosis um, I think any additive that's gonna uh, that's going to uh, 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 stimulate lactic utilizers and some of my yeast products and some of my probiotics fall right in that category there I would um, uh, I've been and some people put yeast cultures and yeast products as probiotics I do not I keep them in a separate category but those two categories can any any product that shows me research that you can utilize lactic acid because that's a sucker that's really gonna probably cause us pH shifts are gonna be a problem in the future do you expect greater use of rumen protected products? Yes, sir. I certainly, I certainly do. I think we're going to see more rumen protected products. You already got your amino acids, you got your choline, you got your niacin. I think you're going to see biotin. I think, I think you see folic acid for you Canadian folks that are doing some work up there. Anything that the rumen really wants to hammer and has value, I'm going to see more protection. And I, I, I like, I like the, I like the encapsulation process. The other one, of course, is your fat products, and now that opens up another uh, uh, challenge. Do you have uh, any comments? On slow release uh, uh, urea products, yeah, they work very, very effectively. Look at your cost-benefit ratio. So certainly, I know there are two or three of them that are available here. They work very, very well. Uh, just look at the cost on them at, at this stage of the game. But they do break down slowly, no question about that. Can rumenzin decrease fiber digestibility in the room depending on the level of rumenzin being fed? Boy, that is interesting. Boy, that is an interesting one. Uh, it changes the room environment. Uh, if a decrease, if the P and that's associated with a pH fact, bingo, you got it. You got it. Now, I didn't say rumenzin caused the pH drop, but by changing the rumen microbes, increasing the propionic acid producing bacteria, you might see a rumen pH shift. And if you do that, then you're fiber digesting. Uh, don't know that answer. Does bovamine uh, product uh, that's a probiotic interact with rumenzin? I don't know. I just don't dare answer that. Lucas, we're going to turn back to you and wind her up. Sure. Well, thank you for the rapid fire on, on those questions, Michael. Well done webinar and, and a great job answering everyone's questions. If everyone's still on, we're going to send you a quick seven-question survey. And one of the things of those seven questions we really want to know is uh, how you learned about the webinar so we can share this with more people, see, see how people who are on learned about it and, and what was most effective there. Uh, of course, the webinar will be posted in our archives and on YouTube in the next few days. Uh, your email with the survey will let you know that that webinar has been posted. Thanks again to Mike for presenting and to Alanco for, for bringing us this webinar. Uh, they've, been, they've been great sponsors to us, and, and our sponsors, again, uh, allow us to keep these webinars to be free. So, Mike, thanks again. Patty and Jim, appreciate the assist. And to everyone who's still on, thanks and have a happy Monday.